Hello and welcome to this short clip on epoxy ethane. Um, it's no longer on the A-level syllabus, uh, but it wasn't always the case. Sometimes uh, questions on it came up, and in some exam boards they actually required you to know a little bit about it. So it's close enough to A-level to warrant doing a bit of a, a closer look of. It's a very interesting and useful compound, um, and I've managed to find a deductive question on it from an exam paper from a past specification, which is always worth trying to connect to. Um, so it gives you a, an opportunity to see how they might stretch and challenge you a little bit. So, like I say, it's not required to be part of your knowledge. You don't need to go and do a flashcard on it, you don't need to go and revise it. But I have seen exam questions that give you a little bit of information, just enough to go away and think about, and require you to do some deductive, deductive style thinking uh, there on the spot, as opposed to recall of information that you'd be expected to find in your textbook. So, like I mentioned, it's a cyclic ether. And the ether functional group is usually considered as RCOCR. -C so the actual ether functional group is normally the carbon oxygen carbon bond, such as this one here. Because of the tendency for the carbon oxygen carbon ring to pop open in chemical reactions, it's actually highly poisonous. It's a carcinogen, hence the um, carcinogenic internal damage hazard sign on the bottom left of the screen. Sometimes it's called ethylene oxide um, instead of epoxy ethane. Either way, it's basically a heavy gas. Um, it's in the gaseous state, but it's heavier than air. Um, so any exposure to it is, uh, is very serious indeed. Um, so you have to treat it with a great deal of care and respect. So it's extremely useful because it can be used to produce ethane-1,2-diol, which is used in antigen freeze and the production of polyesters. Um, so basically it's produced from ethane gas uh, and in carefully controlled conditions, um, in the presence of air or oxygen, it uh, is, convert is produced, uh, but you need a silver catalyst to make this work. But uh, like I've mentioned, the three-membered ring is strained. The bond angles are strained at 60 degrees and uh, therefore it's very easy to break this ring open and it results in high reactivity and as such high toxicity as well. So in the presence of a silver catalyst and a uh, sort of modicum of pressure and high temperature uh, in, in the supply of oxygen, ethene gas will turn into epoxy ethane. And as you can see, like we mentioned before, it's also used to make diols, that is alcohols with two OH groups. So the first thing that happens, as you can notice, is that the presence of an acid catalyst will enable the ring to break open, or at least the ring to become charged. The oxygen on the, on the ring becomes positively charged, and in the presence of H2O, it becomes protonated. So essentially, using a water molecule in the presence of an acid allows us to hydrolyze the ring structure. So we're just looking at this particular part here. It's not the whole molecule that's been hydrolyzed, just the ring part of the structure. So the ring has been broken open and two OH groups have been added. So obviously what you get at the end is an H+. So that would justify why it's a catalyst because it's regenerated at the end. The way they put it in their, um, their diagram there is minus H+. Plus. So, although it may look like a simple reaction, the mechanism that goes with it is fairly complicated, but uh, there was an exam question from a few years back that uh, gave you some information and asked you to try and deduce what was going on in the mechanism for this particular reaction. So the first part of the question says that it's a synthetic intermediate that is used to make ethane-1,2-diol, like we've just looked at, and some polymers. So the controlled catalyzed reaction of ethene with oxygen forms epoxy ethane is the only product, and it asks you to write an equation for this. So there's not enough information within that sentence to enable us to deduce what the answer might be. So that's basically written down what the question's told us, but we haven't balanced it yet. So I would suggest putting in something like this, and also this, just so it's balanced for oxygen. And it says when burnt in excess oxygen, 
ethene completely combusts. So what they're obviously saying is that depending on the amount of oxygen that's available, it'll either combust or it'll produce epoxy ethane in the presence of a catalyst, like we've talked about. So it wants the equation for the complete combustion of ethene. So to do that, I simply went through the process of creating two carbon dioxides because of my two carbons and two waters because of my four hydrogens, and then just made the oxygen fit on the left-hand side. So the next part of the question says, epoxy ethane reacts with water in the presence of an acid to form ethane 1,2-diol. Let's move the page up so we can have a look at that. And it gives the mechanism for the reaction. So as you can see, it's reasonably complicated. Um, it's nothing like what you'd expect to see in an A-level paper. So they're just telling you that's what the mechanism is. Now let's have a look at what they want us to do. If you go over here, first thing they want is to draw dipoles on the carbon and oxygen atoms on the displayed formula of epoxy ethane. Now this shouldn't be too difficult because, as you know, carbon is less electronegative than oxygen, so it should form a permanent dipole if they're bonded together. So it doesn't matter which of the two carbons you give as delta plus, as long as the carbon is delta plus and the oxygen is delta minus. Then it says the mechanism uses the curly arrow model. So it started to become apparent what the question is about. It's not about knowing about epoxy ethane. It's about applying what you know about mechanisms to one that you wouldn't have come across. So it's deliberately deductive. Can you deal with an unfamiliar situation? So that's the kind of head you have to have on when you're doing this type of question. Then it says, what type of bond fission occurs in step two? So let's go back and have a look. So in step two, let's just identify it. So two electrons are moving. And therefore, that must mean that because both of them are moving onto one atom, that would make it heterolytic. Now, they want you to explain your answer, so we've got to put down a reason why we're talking about that. And obviously, it's because both electrons in the carbon oxygen bond go to the oxygen atom. If we were to go and have another look, you can see what I mean. So it's this part here. So the next question says, how can you tell that water is behaving as a nucleophile in step 3? Let's have a look. So in step 3, you have a lone pair forming a data covalent bond. And the data covalent bond is between oxygen and the water and a carbon. So therefore we can put that down as our answer. And the next part of the question says, how does the mechanism show that H plus ions act as a catalyst in this reaction? It says refer to the steps in the mechanism in your answer. Now, notice it's plural, steps. OK, so let's have a look at more than one step over here. So just remember, while I pull the page over, we're looking for the regeneration of H+. So if we look here, H+, is used in step one. And over here, H plus is regenerated in step four. So now we can go back over to the question and just fill that in to get that mark. And it says epoxy ethane reacts with methanol to form a compound with the molecular formula C3H8. O2. Then it says suggest the structure of this compound. So let's draw out our epoxy ethane and our methanol. So I've done each compound in two different colours, and the part of the compound in the product that is from epoxy ethane I've left in red. 
So this should make it fairly easy to work out how the methanol will actually end up added onto that. A little bit like that. So the H from the methanol, that is the H on the OH group, goes on to one oxygen that's already there, and then the remaining carbon on the right-hand side picks up the remainder of the methanol molecule. So just going through the mark scheme, we definitely got that first one, and we also got the idea of the complete combustion of ethene, and we got the correct dipole in the second one as well, for part B that is. Okay, so some movement of an electron pair, that bit's really important. It's heterolytic fission, and both electrons go to the same atom. We actually said it went to the oxygen atom. Sorry, I meant the lone pair from the oxygen atom moved towards the carbon. So it donates a pair of electrons, and we talked about step one and step four. Now let's have a little quick look to see if our structure was right. There we go, we got that one as well. So we had the OCH3 on one and the H from another. Let me just circle that a bit better. So e.g. circled groups were CH3OH. Okay, so hopefully you found this a reasonably useful introductory clip into something that, although you don't need to know about it, it's a useful extension topic because it takes your understanding of mechanisms to a, a new level. It makes sure that you know what curly arrows are, that you know what nucleophiles are, that you know what happens when an electron pair moves from one part of a molecule to another. Okay, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening and perhaps see you soon. Bye then.